If I asked you what the most important trait is in the evolution of humans from our very origins to the individuals we are today, what would you say? Most people would start with intelligence. And while intelligence is no doubt the key factor that makes us successful, it is our hands that allow us to use our intelligence to its fullest capacity. If we were still four-legged creatures or lived in the ocean, fire cities and agriculture would all likely not exist. It is our transition to bipedalism that allowed us to bridge the gap and use our intelligence to its fullest capacity. So as I'm sure you're already aware, this video is about evolution, but not in the way that you think. Today, I want to use video games to demonstrate how an animal can transition from walking on four legs to walking on two. Long before humans, bipedalism evolved separately in many different lineages. Terrorbirds, velociraptors, and kangaroos, just to name a few, all evolved to walk on two legs. But bipedalism without flight or the intelligence to match comes with significant costs, doesn't it? I mean, the fastest and most agile land animals all move around using four limbs. The fastest sea dwellers all also utilize multiple flippers. Several theories have been put forward to understand how and why animals began to walk on two legs. Yet no theory put forth has been widely accepted as of yet. One theory suggests bipedalism evolved for enhanced speed, which is obviously wrong. Another theory ties bipedalism to tool usage, which is what Darwin believed, and suggests activities like hunting led to bipedalism, specifically so hominids could be free to use their hands for weapons. However, even this theory faces criticism, as the earliest evidence of stone tools dates back only to about 3.3 million years ago, which is way after hominids had already adopted bipedalism. Since then, even more theories have emerged suggesting different reasons behind the evolution of bipedalism. These include ideas like avoiding predators, standing tall for keeping watch, tracking migrating herds across the savanna, or for energy conservation. Some even speculate bipedalism evolved as a protection against harmful sun rays, as standing upright would result in less of the body's surface area being exposed. A very unique perspective to say the least, but probably not true. Even so, from prior archaeological evidence, most scientists believe before bipedalism, primates were likely terrestrial quadrupeds, using their knuckles to walk, much like the modern chimpanzees of today. It's also possible that at the same time, the first walkers were well prepared for climbing, could traverse bipedally in branches, and stood upright to scan for danger. For any species moving into a new niche, two general requirements are necessary. First, there has to be a pathway for the organism to move from one niche into another, which, when analyzing chimpanzees, was clearly the case in us. Second, there has to be some significant advantage for moving into a new niche, so bipedalism had to have offered a significant advantage even without us having the cognitive traits necessary to make use of tools. And this, my friends, is where the game Evolution by K1 comes in. This game is an evolution-based simulator that allows you to build digital organisms in any manner you wish, who will then try to move as far as possible. First, joints and bones provide the foundation, shaping the outline of your creation. Then, muscle fibers are attached to bring your creation to life. The AI will then work to optimize movement, trying to find the most efficient way to get as far as possible. The AI will do its best, but of course, the neural network does not know what walking is, and so the AI will struggle trying to figure it out on its own, through, you guessed it, a process of trial and error. At first, every design will fail miserably, but with enough patience and enough time, eventually the creature will start to figure it out, but sometimes not in the way you intended. Still, this simulation is perfect for trying to model how bipedalism evolved, as even though it can reliably showcase all of the selection pressures that contributed to the evolution of bipedalism, it does have one key component that can aid our search efforts, natural selection. This game has one selection pressure, trying to move. But since there is a time constraint, the AI is incentivized to try and find the most efficient manner for getting as far as possible in the quickest amount of time. And eventually, the neural network will learn how to walk or run or jump in a way that is strikingly similar to the real thing. And in doing so, does an excellent job of capturing the relentless, high-stakes nature of natural selection. Specifically, because it can shine a light on how certain structures meant for one task can quickly pave the way for a transition into use for a new task when the right selection pressures are in place. My design is similar to a knuckle-walking quadruped, with one specific detail I want you to notice. There is a differentiation between the fore and hind limbs. 
my design has significantly stronger hind legs similar to that of, say, a chimpanzee, with forelimbs meant for climbing, at least that's what I intended. At first, the design will use its forelimbs to help in walking, but as it gets better with a few adjustments on my part, the AI will learn to eventually transition to using its hind legs, as they are more efficient due to changes in structure. Obviously, the model organism is a good but not great representation of how bipedalism could have evolved in our history. Mainly because there's so many more variables that we can't possibly take into account, like how the structure of our feet would have changed over time. But there are real life examples that can help us understand how. Studies on gibbons, known for engaging in arboreal activities, support the niche transition idea. Gibbons, despite being occasional bipedal walkers, have features like relatively long lower limbs, the same number of vertebrae in the lower back as humans, and chests with a human-like configuration. When on the ground, gibbons prefer to move bipedally, even though they are not built for it, probably because moving around on two legs is less energy intensive than moving around on four, which is what I intended with my model organism. In gibbons, the transition to a fully extended bipedal stance would not have been a major challenge, as all apes have this capacity, though it would involve some changes in the bones, muscles, and joints. The feet in particular would have had to undergo a significant transformation, from a structure used for grappling to one that's used as a propellant. Of course, for this to happen, the environment would have had to favor it. Which is why most archaeologists believe changing global climatic conditions leading to reduced forested areas and more open terrestrial plains is what allowed bipedalism to develop. This is exemplified by the immense diversification in hominids. Ancient hominids occupied diverse biomes in eastern, central, and southern Africa during the Pliocene period. As an example, Aramidus in central Ethiopia favored a woodland habitat, while later Alpharensis in northern Ethiopia occupied landscapes that were more diverse, and likely included riverine forests as well as dry bushland. Kenyanthropus pliops in northern Kenya resided in a relatively well-watered area with closed woodland, while Latioli hominids in northern Tanzania likely thrived in a mosaic of open grassland and more closed woodland. During the Pliocene period, as hominids expanded into diverse habitats, our species underwent a significant evolution. This period saw the development of advanced movement patterns, a growth in brain size, and notable changes in the structures of our hands and feet. So the key idea is that the environment makes the difference, but that's kind of obvious. So we need to approach this from a deeper perspective. If we take a look at all organisms that eventually transition to bipedalism, they all have something in common. There was already a level of differentiation that was necessary. Most primates were tree climbers, which resulted in similar but distinct ways of using their hands and feet. Penguins had wings, which then adapted to use in the water. And ostriches are birds whose transition to bipedalism was likely due to life in the savanna. Bipedalism's advantage, among other things, is the fact that it frees the upper limbs for other uses. And based off skeletal remains, early hominids displayed a blend of ape and human-like traits. Their anatomy included things like curved fingers and toes, and long upper limbs just like non-human primates of today. But on the other hand, they had distinctive characteristics of bipedalism, like knees that angled inwards, and iliac blades that were short and faced somewhat to the side. While archaeologists still debate on how these primitive humans moved, the emergence of Homo erectus around 1.8 million years ago is a point of little contention, and it's widely accepted that Homo erectus walked and ran in a way that is very similar to modern humans of today. But bipedalism can function differently in different species, kind of like how both bats and birds fly but do so with very different anatomies. British and autonomist Herbert Elfman was the first to discover that non-human primates have a form of bipedalism that is more flexible compared to us. In human walking, there's a notable difference from apes, as humans maintain a more upright stance with less bending at the knees, hips, and ankles. But when people are directed to walk with minimal side-to-side -side swaying of their center of mass, they typically assume lower limb positions marked by the use of bending, a stance that is very commonly seen in apes. When humans walk normally, the force exerted on the ground shows two distinct peaks during each step, a pattern which indicates a stiff-legged way of walking, where the body's center of mass is highest when one foot is in the middle of its step, and lowest when both feet are on the ground. On the other hand, when non-human primates walk on two legs, the force they exert on the ground has a single peak, much closer to their body weight. The key finding, however, is that when humans walk with more flexible leg positions, 
the force produced and the manner of walking closely resembles that of non-human primates. Due to this striking similarity, it's reasonable to assume early hominids who walked upright would have adopted a similar flexible walking style, suggesting our early hominid ancestors likely employed this form of movement before fully transitioning to bipedalism. Even so, the manner of movement in our ancestors that immediately preceded bipedalism has been a topic of debate, and theories fall into one of three basic groups. The first model proposes a terrestrial knuckle-walking chimpanzee as the prototype for a pre-hominid. Supporters of this idea think that the ancestor probably engaged in terrestrial locomotion, but acknowledge that tree climbing is what probably contributed to the evolution of bipedalism. Supporters of the second model suggest that bipedalism evolved from a small-bodied ancestor similar to gibbons, who prefer walking bipedally when on the ground. Finally, some researchers suggest the mechanical requirements for climbing are closely linked to the structures needed to move bipedally by early hominid beings, and as a result, argue there is no model for a pre-hominid who walked upright. Of all these theories, experimental studies lean towards an arboreal climbing ancestor for early humans, as the mechanics of climbing and bipedalism are more similar to each other than either is to the mechanics of walking on all fours. More support for the idea of an arboreal ancestry is found in studies using force plates, which is one that I brought up earlier. In the end, bipedalism's exact point of evolution is something that is still an area of debate. It's extremely difficult to pinpoint, and the validity of different theories are still considered even today. Nonetheless, there are two key points I wanted to shine a light on. First, it's likely that the arboreal nature of primitive apes is what originally allowed bipedalism to evolve, as the structures needed for climbing and for walking are very similar. Secondly, it was the differentiation that occurred between the fore and high limbs as a result of previous adaptations that ultimately allowed bipedalism to develop, just like in the model.